Wonderful. Good morning, Ellie. Thank you very much indeed for that introduction. It's a great pleasure to be with you here this morning as the UK's Minister for Technology and the Digital Economy. Uh, I'm really delighted to be speaking to the UK uh, IGF. And I'm extremely uh, interested and excited to hear about the breadth of topics that are going to be discussed during this two-day event. And I think your agenda covers some incredibly important areas in my department, including uh, policy making on online safety and data protection, the critical debate over the future of the internet, and it's a real pleasure to have the opportunity to talk about some of these areas and how uh, the UK is driving them forward. Uh, we believe, the government believes uh, very, very firmly that technology is an overwhelming force for good uh, in the world and in the UK as well, and we are determined to do everything we can to promote the United Kingdom as a global centre for, for innovation, uh, for growth and for investment. Uh, it is one of the government's critical priorities. I'm delighted to say that we're in a good position, as of course you all know. Uh, if you look at uh, investment flowing into the uh, tech sector, so far this year we've had uh, over 30 billion US dollars of investment into, into UK private investment, into, into UK uh, investment into private companies. Uh, that is more than any other European country. In fact, it's over twice the second country, which is, uh, which is Germany. Uh, we have seen, I think, 20 new tech unicorns in the first half of this year. We've got 105 uh, unicorns in total, which is more than Germany, France and Israel put together. Uh, so we are determined to, uh, to build on and improve that uh, phenomenal track record here in the UK. And one of my jobs is to uh, identify any roadblocks which are inhibiting our most successful and innovative companies from getting established, from scaling up, from growing and ultimately floating uh, and remove those roadblocks from, from their path, whether it's um, you know, doing more on, uh, on skills or visas uh, or encouraging uh, more R&D, relevant R&D in our universities and tech transfer from universities into the commercial world, whether it's making sure the London Stock Exchange is the best for listing, um, or whether it's making sure that our VC environment is as vibrant as it can be. All of those are things on my agenda to try and make sure we maintain our uh, great existing position in, in tech, but do more than just maintain it, uh, grow it as well. Um, but of course, it, it's clear that um, the benefits of an increasingly digitized and data-enabled world um, bring with them some, some risks as well, which you'll be exploring later today. And um, we need to be obviously mindful uh, of those and sort of continue um, to explore and implement measures that will allow our thriving digital economy to grow, provide better public services and benefits to our society while looking to protect against and mitigate those risks, but in a, in a, in a way that doesn't, critically doesn't inhibit, um, doesn't inhibit, I think sometimes some other regulatory um, environments like the European Union, for example, um, sometimes regulate in a way that inhibits innovation and growth. We definitely don't want to do that. Um, I'd like to, to start by focusing on our online safety agenda, um, which is an area where the UK government is proud to be leading, um, leading the way. My predecessor, Caroline Dynage, um, spoke about the importance of internet safety at previous IGF uh, events. I think people here will be familiar with the government's um, broad and extensive uh, approach to consulting on this area, including policy analysis, uh, stakeholder engagement, and so on. Um, and I'm sure everyone on this call, uh, on this meeting, will be uh, familiar with the draft online safety bill, which we published in May of this year, May of this year um, together with confirmation that Ofcom would be the relevant regulator. And the publication of that draft bill is a critical um, milestone in our journey to making sure the UK is one of the safest places in the world online. We think this is a world-leading piece of legislation. Um, the draft bill uh, will apply to companies where users are posting content or interacting with each other, that includes search engines. And our approach is to strike the right balance between tackling harm without imposing unnecessary burdens on companies, particularly where they're, where they're low risk. Um, importantly, a duty of care will be introduced uh, and in-scope companies will need to remove and prevent the spread of illegal content, content which is prohibited by law. And they'll need to be, um, they'll, they'll have a duty to actually proactively uh, seek out that content 
and also have accessible and rapid reporting mechanisms. There are also some specific duties to protect children from harm um, online, um, and there is also uh, there are also some provisions um, to make to, to, to clarify or require the larger companies, um, the sort of Facebook level companies, to um, to clarify their rules and enforce them consistently around content which is legal but potentially harmful. Um, all of those uh, laws will get enforced by Ofcom um, acting as the regulator, the appointed regulator in this space. Um, the bill is currently undergoing free legislative scrutiny by a joint parliamentary committee, which will deliver its findings, I think, on or before the 10th of December this year, so relatively soon. Um, the government will consider very carefully the, the comments uh, made by that joint committee and indeed comments made by, by other people as well. Um, and it is, it is likely, very likely, that we'll make some various changes um, to the draft bill before its introduction um, to improve it. Uh, in some cases, it'll go further towards protecting the public. We've obviously heard quite a lot of debate about that recently. Um, and we'll then introduce the bill uh, as, as parliamentary time uh, allows, but we would expect that um, we hope to be in the first half of next year, so we can get on and, and pass the bill into law. Um, of course, uh, we recognise that regulation is only one tool in tackling the issue, um, and therefore uh, there are a number of, of other things we're doing in the non-legislative space to tackle online harms. Um, safety technology is one of those. Um, for example, age assurance technologies to make sure that children are protected from harmful content. Um, we've been working very closely with the fast growing and world leading UK safety tech sector to develop solutions that will help, technical solutions, that will help companies comply with their new requirements. Um, the UK sector here, I think, is, is, is growing very, um, very rapidly. Uh, last year, it showed 40% growth up to 300 million pounds of revenue, um, and it continues to grow. And we're really keen to support that safety tech sector, um, not just in London, of course, but in hubs like Leeds, Cambridge, and Edinburgh. And speaking of Leeds, I visited Crisp up in Leeds um, just a couple of weeks ago, who are a genuine global leader in the safety tech, um, safety tech space. In terms of online media uh, literacy, that is obviously critical in tackling online harms. Uh, besides creating a safer online environment, um, we know users want to be empowered with the skills and knowledge required to navigate the online world um, safely. Um, so it's important that we continue to build those uh, media and online literacy skills. We published a strategy last summer, um, setting out our ambition in this area. Um, and we're looking obviously at uh, international best practice uh, as well, including the OECD's uh, recommendations on children in the digital environment. Um, in terms of international engagement, uh, we think that is really important. Clearly harmful content doesn't respect international boundaries, and therefore we're working closely with our international partners. Uh, we hold, as you probably know, the G7 presidency this year, and as part of that we brought together those G7 leading economies uh, around um, these uh, issues, and we secured agreement on a set of internet safety principles between those G7 uh, countries, which is a really significant step. Um, and in March 2020, last year, in collaboration um, with um, the five country ministerial representatives, uh, US, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and the UK, we formally launched the voluntary principles to counter online child exploitation and abuse. So we're, we're working uh, multilaterally and plurilaterally um, as well. But we think our unilateral actions, particularly via the online safety bill and other steps, we think will provide um, a, an example that we hope uh, many other countries around the world will choose to follow uh, as well. And we're hosting various events in the next couple of months, actually, um, including the, um, the Future Tech Forum, uh, where we hope to, to, to work with other countries on these, on these issues. In terms of um, data protection, which I know you're addressing today, um, the future of the UK's data protection framework is very important. Uh, we've set out a national data strategy. We think data is a huge strategic asset and is the driving force of our modern economies. 65% um, of UK businesses handle some form of personal data, and we want to unlock the power of that data to drive um, innovation and boost the economy. And that was at the heart of our AI strategy that we uh, launched a few weeks ago, because clearly AI requires large data sets to, um, to operate. So we think the intersection of data and AI is really, um, really interesting. Um, we um, know data has always been economically 
important is clearly now important on a scale that's unprecedented for all the reasons we, we know about. Um, and we also know just how damaging it is if we, uh, if we lose data. We've seen that during the pandemic um, as well. So um, we're very keen to uh, make sure we, we find um, ways of, of, of protecting that data and, and, and protecting it from loss um, as well. Um, as with online harms, um, data reform poses challenging policy questions um, for government. Um, living in a scientific superpower, as we do in the UK, um, it, it's, uh, we don't want to see any kind of research um, stopped in its tracks, and we don't want to see scientists prevented from pursuing um, new ideas because of um, particular restrictions, unreasonable restrictions on data uh, to do, for example, with the original use it was collected for. Um, so our proposed reforms are designed to unlock the potential of scientific data while maintaining public trust uh, in the research which it enables. And we hope we can go um, further than, than many other countries um, have done in that area to enable scientific research here in, here in the UK. Um, the launch of our consultation is the first step uh, in the process to reforming uh, the UK's data regime, uh, balancing obviously public protection with um, innovation. Um, in terms of, of the sort of future of the internet um, more broadly, hugely, uh, clearly a, a huge topic, um, we know the internet is not static. Uh, it's underpinned by a complex assortment of constantly evolving uh, technologies, which will continue to evolve probably at ever greater um, paces. Um, so our ambition is to work uh, within your community, with the community, as a constructive partner to uh, protect an accessible and interoperable global internet for future generations, uh, which means, which includes protecting the right for people to share information and communicate freely over the internet. Uh, it means redoubling our support for diverse participation in the multi-stakeholder model of internet governance through bodies such as uh, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, and of course the UNIGF, um, and opposing efforts uh, to bring management of the internet under restrictive intergovernmental control. We think these uh, industry-based bodies are much better than having uh, go sovereign governments trying to unduly um, interfere, which is, uh, we think, quite an important uh, principle. Um, for future generations online, and as internet access is extended uh, to the 50% of the world's population currently unconnected, uh, the UK will work to develop new public policy approaches to technology to encourage innovation and interoperability while protecting rights and freedoms. And our work, uh, as we've presided over the G7, um, has been a really important part of that. We want to make work very closely with stakeholders such as those uh, with us this morning to make that happen. Um, look, I think the message I'd really like to, to leave uh, today is that the government sees uh, technology in all its forms um, as critical to this country's future. We are determined to be a digital superpower, a scientific superpower. We want to invest in making that happen. I think we'll see some announcements in the, the budget and spending review in a couple of weeks' time. In fact, not even a couple of weeks. It's a week today, the 27th of October. We'll see some announcements that will further support that. Um, certainly, uh, the, both the Treasury, Number 10, and us here at DCMS uh, are doing everything we will do, are doing and will do everything we can to enable uh, technological uh, growth, while at the same time making sure the UK is the safest place to be online. But we'll always do that in a way which is as light touch as it possibly can be. And we're always going to try and uh, encourage and foster innovation and growth and avoid the mistakes that some other governments and some other regulators make, which has runs the risk of stifling uh, innovation and stifling growth. Um, so I'm very excited to be joining you this morning and I'm enormously looking forward to working with you in the coming months and years on this agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. I think we've got a few minutes to, uh, to cover some uh, questions now. And we've had uh, questions submitted from uh, people who are attending the, the, the day today and also from the steering committee. You probably won't be surprised that quite a few of those relate to um, the uh, online safety bill, uh, lots of interest in that area. And I know you've, you've talked very much about the need to, to protect and mitigate against risk without, without inhibiting growth. Um, I'd just be keen to understand a bit more about where you see the potential challenges in terms of, of, of getting that bill through Parliament? What is it, what sort of, what do you see um, that, that we might be facing there? 
And, well, it's a bill where lots of people have very strong opinions, and you'll, you'll have seen actually in Parliament on, on Monday, following the tragic murder of David Amos, um, it, that raised questions to do with the online safety bill. And I, mean, I, th I think the, the, the balance of parliamentary opinion um, is, is that um, we do need to do um, significantly more to protect people online, particularly on platforms that are um, sort of so ubiquitous um, and touch so many people's lives. Uh, and I think we are, we're gonna see probably uh, various um, suggestions made that we're gonna have to carefully navigate and carefully balance. We are uh, very much in listening mode, responding to the joint committee, which is, which is taking evidence as we speak. Um, and we're going to look very carefully at what they say. We are, uh, we will, I think, be making some changes and improvements um, to the bill. Um, but it, it's going to be hotly debated, both in the Commons um, and in the Lords um, as well. Yeah, yeah, understood. And um, and again, I mean, you talked as well about how important that plurilateral approach is when you're tackling something that doesn't know national boundaries. Um, I wonder if there are other sort of lessons that. Um, we could learn from, or the dis uh, from the discussions that, that you've been having, um, you know, on that sort of global nature of, of, of some of the issues that we're trying to tackle, that we could take to the, the UN IGF in December when we're trying to bring together different perspectives from around the world. Yeah, I mean that's a very a very important forum. I mean I think there's uh, clearly when you're trying to make changes, there's there's a tension between um, between speed and global reach, right? So you can I think there's an African uh, saying, if you want to travel fast, travel alone. If you want to travel far, travel together. And I think we need to, the truth is, we need to um, do a combination of both. So via the online safety bill, we're effectively acting unilaterally and saying to the, uh, to, uh, on, you know, the social media companies um, that if you want to do business in the UK, then here are the rules that you need to abide by. And we're doing that unilaterally, we're doing it now. But I think in parallel with that and complementary to that, our actions on a um, multilateral and plurilateral basis. And we really want to encourage other countries, particularly like-minded countries, um, to adopt similar approaches. And we are definitely going to work with, um, you know, with the UN, the G7, a whole range of other um, groups. We're hosting um, a, a, quite a large number of countries, as I said earlier, in, in just a few weeks' time in London to talk about some of these issues at a conference that we've, we've organized. So we're definitely going to be pushing forward on, on multilaterally as well via established forum, fora, and fora that we're, we're, we're creating ourselves. But we, we, can't, we can't wait for that. We've got to act ourselves as well. There's quite a good parallel in international tax. So we've pushed forward with a bunch of measures, the Treasury have, um, to make sure that um, companies you know, pay their fair share of tax, global companies, like the diverted profit tax was an example of that. But we've also, act, we did that like four or five years ago. We've also acted via the OECD to put in place global tax rules that got announced like a couple of weeks ago but there was like a five year gap, right? So we can't let, we can't wait for that five years. We've got to act domestically straight away too. Yeah, yeah. And I know that um, UK government and DCMS have been very supportive of that multi-stakeholder approach. And you're talking there obviously about bringing like-minded um, uh, countries together to talk about you know, creation of standards and 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 uh, driving the, the right behaviours. I wonder what concrete actions um, you are taking to protect the the kind of global internet, where we're maybe not dealing with like-minded countries. Are there other concrete actions the UK government is taking? Yes, I mean, I need to be to choose my words carefully here. Um, clearly, there are some countries around the world, and I can imagine the one the one in particular, or the ones that you're you're, you're thinking of. Um, whose uh, commitment to um, openness, transparency, uh, personal privacy um, are, are not the same as the values that, that we have. And it is important that we, I mean, I guess firstly try and persuade those countries that don't share our view to change their opinion um, and persuade them of the benefits of, of openness and, and, and transparency and, and freedom and privacy and all those things. Um, but to the extent that we can't persuade them to do that, and it is in some cases uh, something of an uphill struggle, then I think we need to just... Um, ensure that um, they don't capture um, certain institutions which could have a chilling or a negative effect and we need to work with um, the, the, the thankfully large number of like-minded countries who share our uh, values and vision on this but it's something that requires i think constant uh, constant evangelism by government and by the industry and it requires constant i think constant diplomatic um, attention as well and it's something that um, you know, I'm personally committed to doing. I, I meet regularly with our international department here at DCMS who work closely with the Foreign Office, um, the FCDO, 
uh, and you know I, I'm in, I'm I am investing and will will invest quite a lot of time personally in making sure I talk to other countries around the world to maintain a a, a powerful coalition in defense of, of our freedoms and values on the internet. Mm -hmm. and, and also, and again, you, you, you mentioned um, in your opening about some, the potential of the chilling effect of, of, of regulation. And um, someone has uh, wanted to ask a question around um, comments from the former Google CEO, Eric Schmidt, um, describing the uh, EU AI Act's transparency requirements as being very harmful to Europe. Um, do, do you have a view on uh, AI and algorithmic transparency and, and whether there's potential damage there? Um, how do we um, you know, make sure that uh, that isn't the case in, in the UK, that we can continue to see that, that growth that you've talked about in yeah. those, those key sectors? Yeah, it's a great question. So we're going to be the government's going to be laying out its views on AI regulation in, in, a, in a paper in the coming coming few months. But the principles that will underlie that um, will be uh, keeping any regulation regulatory intervention as light touch and as minimal as possible. So we don't stifle innovation. One of the uh, clearly one of the freedoms um, that we have after leaving the European Union is freedom for regulatory um, action, particularly in emerging areas. And AI is a good example of that and you know we want to make sure that we keep a light touch approach obviously prevent harm where there is a risk risk of it but doing the absolute uh, minimum to meet that objective and no more rather than i think some other jurisdictions uh, make the sort of uh, kind of an assumption that things are harmful unless it can be proven otherwise which leads to quite oppressive um quite oppressive regulation and there's an interesting uh, sort of uh, precedent example or analogy in gm genetically um, modified uh, crop technology, where the European Union some years ago uh, took a very um, sort of, uh, I'm trying to try try choose the right word here, but quite a restrictive approach in its regulation. And as a consequence, Europe, which of the European Union, which included at the time the UK, um, sort of lost an advantage to the US, which took a much more um, pro growth approach. And consequently, like the sort of GM capital of the world is the US, not the UK or the European Union. Um, we, we definitely do not want to repeat that kind of um, mistake when it comes to emerging technologies um, like AI. And I think that approach will be reflected in the paper we're gonna be bringing forward um, in the next few months. Great, well, I suspect that may overlap as well with my final question. Um, so you, you've talked um, a lot about just the extraordinary levels of investment coming into to the UK, um, but I wondered what you think are the three most important things for the UK to be doing now to ensure that we do become that digital superpower um, that you clearly aspire for us to be? Yeah. Well, I think we should be clear that we are currently by far and away Europe's leader in this area. So uh, if you look at most metrics uh, around you know, sort of, of, of tech leadership and, and tech um, development, um, we are by far the leading uh, nation in Europe and we're the third in the world on most measures behind the US and China, right? So we should be clear that our starting point is a really great one. But the question is, how do we go from, from that position to an even better one? Um, and I think there are, um, there are kind of three critical ingredients you need um, for success in this sphere. Um, which are um, their ideas, people, and funding, right? Uh, innovative ideas, the people to execute those ideas, and the funding to finance them. And if you can bring together those three things in a sort of, uh, in a kind of cold fusion, push them together, crush them together, then innovation and growth springs out of that uh, combination. Uh, and we need to take action to do, to, to improve our performance in all three areas. Um, so in terms of people, there's obviously a lot of work to do in the skills agenda that you know, start, starting in schools. So a bigger emphasis on math, science, coding, tech in schools, um, conversion courses at universities. We've got a whole load of conversion courses that we're funding um, through the PhDs. We're currently funding, for example, a thousand PhDs in artificial intelligence, which is fantastic um, and lifelong learning. Right. But we also need to make sure that the most talented people globally can come here. So we're, we've are we got some new visa routes. There's a new um, scale up visa route opening up in a couple of months in March of next year. So, so fast growth companies can bring people in to the UK much more easily, right? So if somebody is super bright, uh, wherever they are in the world, we want to be able to come here quickly and easily. So I think that's the people bit. Um, on the ideas bit, I talked a bit in my opening remarks about um, you know, funding for un raw university research, which often, often kind of feeds later into um, in, into, into practical applications. So I remember um, I studied uh, physics at Oxford in the mid 1990s. And I remember um, there was um, work going on at the time on quantum computing, right? Which at the time was like very, was largely theoretical. Um, but now obviously 20 years later, 25 years later, um, we're seeing it getting deployed in, in sort of real life 
um, situations. And I think that that tech transfer from university to commercialization is something that US universities do unbelievably well. And I think we can do better at that here in the UK. We do some already, but we need to do a lot more. Um, and the third area is funding I mentioned. Um, so the, um, I think we're, we're good at the seed stage investments. I think SEIS, uh, things like SEIS, EIS, VCT, are all good, uh, although I, I am, I am uh, lobbying to, to, to improve them further by increasing some of the, the limits. Um, our VC community is good at the um, sort of Series A, Series B level. Um, I think we need to do more to get institutional capital, by which I mean pension fund money and insurance company money, into our VC community to fund Series C scale-up uh, investments. So that's the sort of 50, 100, 150 million pound checks for, for really meaningful scale-up. And one of the things, they're, they're, they're not participating. UK pension funds, UK insurance companies are not investing as much as I think they could or should in the sector. Um, so for example, 65% of funding into US VC comes from US pension plans. In the UK, the equivalent figure is only 12%. So I see a huge opportunity um, to try and encourage that. Um, and as far as the, the sort of the very final leg in the capital journey is concerned, so I've started at the small, I'm going to the big, the final leg in the journey is the public stock market IPOs um, and the London Stock Exchange um, is, is good. We've had some good IPOs this year, including Oxford Nanoport just a few weeks ago. Um, but our market share of tech IPOs is lower than it should be. We've seen some of our best firms choosing to list in NASDAQ in New York, like um, Accenture, which is an Oxford based um, AI company, medical science AI company. Um, you know, we'd, I'd, I'd like to, to get more of those companies listed here. And the Hill Review, which is being implemented, I think will help that. So it's that, that cold fusion of people, ideas, and funding and if we get those three things together here in the uk then there will be a, an even bigger explosion of innovation innovation and growth and that's what i'd like to see thank you thank you well thanks very much for for kicking us off today and for giving us uh, your time we're really grateful to have had you here today um, and i'm now going to hand back to nigel um who'll tell us what's happening next thank you very much minister. thank you Bye -bye. thank you so much thank you minister thank you uh, thank you ellie that was a really excellent uh, uh, really excellent session so